the ethics of UBI seminar at Freebus at the University of Freiburg. I'm Carl Weiderquist, the seminar leader. And we have a guest today, Philippe von Perreich. Uh, we've read and discussed his work in his absence, and we have a great luxury today to have him here to respond to, uh, to our discussion of it. And uh, we do have at least, uh, at least one person uh, who is, uh, uh, who is, uh, who is responding to it, uh, who has prepared comments, and that is Dritan. Dritan, uh, would you like to, uh, would you like to take it away? Okay, so you want me to start now? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, well, having read uh, Philip Bampereich's book on basic income, uh, I'd like to provide some uh, discussion points on particular fragments, which I thought could make for a good debate for, for the class. Uh, first of all, I am not of the opinion that the first region on chapter five, uh, by which uh, you aim to relativize free riding, really meets its goal. Given that one's wealth consists of him or her having been emotionally invested into achieving a certain level of success, it is not simply about money anymore. It comes down to a moral dilemma of not letting able people live off your work because it feels like exploiting. And to some degree, to me, it uh, seems like the uh, saving for old age. You reduce consumption today to... Uh, uh, increase consumption tomorrow. And the same uh, could be applicable to this. You work harder today to have more leisure uh, tomorrow. And my question in this is, uh, could fairness uh, be a cover for self-serving behavior as we see self-interested individuals behind the veil of ignorance? So this is my first point and I will proceed further. Oh, no, no, uh, let's, do, let's do, take your points one at a time, because uh, I think this is the point that uh, I think uh, more than just you would like to, to respond to. So uh, that means now, uh, so I'll have Philippe respond to that point, and then I'll take other questions and comments from anyone attending on, but only on this point. So we're staying on this point of is the question of, uh, is uh, Van Price's quest for fairness actually could it be a mask for uh, for I don't know the parasitic self interest? Is that summarizing it fairly, Britton? Maybe. Okay, or for taking advantage. Okay, uh, Philippe, go ahead. Yeah, I can respond to that, but uh, it would be useful also to get structure in the discussion. If you could just mention uh, uh, Britton, you the other points you want to touch and then I'll, I'll, I'll answer to this uh, question. You just mentioned their headings and without developing, which... Okay. which uh... So the second uh, uh, quest, uh, point is uh, funding of UBI and their implications. And I provide some empirical evidence on that. And I ask some questions about it. And then I discuss uh, towards the end of chapter five, I argue uh, your... Um, um, point of view that having an uh, aggregate level of happiness, happiness it, it doesn't make sense as a long-term object, objective. And I discussed some, something about it. Yeah, so basically uh, that's it. Okay. Most. Very good. So, um, yes, the, as far as I remember, so the beginning of that chapter um, is a sort of uh, ad hominem as a set of ad hominem arguments. And so some people say, uh, well, justice really is a matter of uh, fair reward for labor, or it's a matter of uh, reciprocity, and it's a matter of uh, to each according to his or her effort, possibly also the emotional involvement, uh, whatever, and so some sort of merit. And so what we do is that uh, even for People, sorry about that, and should have uh, disconnected. 
uh, even for people uh, who believe in this sort of conception of justice, there may be good reasons to adopt um, the idea of a basic income, if only as a second best in the real world. And so that's the purpose of the beginning of, um, of uh, uh, chapter five. Now, this is not uh, an answer to your question because you are saying, well, um, isn't there then a point at least in one version of these uh, arguments or uh, based on the, what uh, labor uh, deserves, isn't that the one version at least that uh, should be treated more carefully and more convincingly than uh, we do in that part of the chapter. Now, the arguments you use, and, uh, and of course it is uh, present in the debate, is uh, and people who will say, oh, come on, fairness, fairness, uh, this is really something I'm entitled to because I made the effort to produce it. I made it uh, with a view to uh, making some savings or even some immediate consumption, uh, but uh, you mentioned the, the case of saving for old age, and now someone is going to take that away from me. And uh, the, rep the response to that is uh, that, in my view, uh, so a fair system must be one in which uh, all taxation is anticipated, can be anticipated by the people, so that people can't say, oh, well, I uh, use this uh, for, I, I save this for my old age, and now you are taking it away from me. No, people know in advance that part of what uh, they are earning will be taxed away for, from them in order to serve some purposes. This is, of course, the case now, and it is the case with any sort of uh, taxation. So people can't say, I'm outraged because money is taken from me. Uh, there can only be outrage if you adopt some sort of entitlement conception of justice, uh, a libertarian, a la Nozick, or uh, where you say, well, whatever is the product of my labor is something that I own. And, and of course, I regard that conception as totally uh, implausible once you say all the implications of it. And so basically, and so what, uh, and I'll just stop there and by, giving this as, as the general background of this discussion. And so, as you might have perceived in, uh, in, in the book, but also in my other writing, uh, I have, I wouldn't say some fascination, but uh, some, uh, uh, some attraction uh, to uh, a libertarian view, because I attach great, great importance to personal freedom. And so the, the central purpose of my earlier book, Real Freedom for All, consisted in trying to reconcile these two uh, elements that to me are fundamental in a for a conception of a just society, that is equality and freedom. And the way in which I, uh, I did so, or I tried to do so, was by saying, come on libertarians, what you are talking about is not really freedom, because it's not real freedom, and because it's just a formal freedom without, uh, and where you give people certain rights without the capacity to exercise them. So we must take freedom seriously, but it must be real freedom, and it can be combined with equality. It's not against equality, because equality is just a criterion of distribution, and what this distribution must be about for the sake of justice is precisely this real freedom, not to equalize it strictly, but to give it the highest sustainable for the people who are who have least of that freedom. And so therefore, once you have that as by way of background, as a, a fair distribution, then you say, well, people can't complain about being taken, um, being the victims of uh, free riding, of being uh, being exploited. They all get a fair share of what we all <coughs> inherited, and then their work, they're saved, and uh, and and of course, if they work, they'll have a higher income. If they're saved, they're, they'll have a, a greater wealth than other people will have. That's all fair, but it must be against the background of a fair distribution of resources as defined by real freedom for all. So that's basically my answer. So uh, there is a point, I mean, there are two points that are correct in that sort of challenge to my view. One is that freedom is important, 
And the other one is that people should be entitled what they uh, can uh, legitimately expect. And therefore, the taxation for this purpose, for the purpose of a basic income or any other purpose, must be, uh, um, must be anticipated, must be possible for people to anticipate it and then they'll take their decisions to work, save, in, invest, uh, train, etc. in that light. Okay, um, now, first of all, uh, uh, I, my, my hand is up, you all can't see it because you don't need to, but um, uh, so I, I could respond to this issue as well. Um, and, uh, but uh, first of all, Dritzan, he, he gave uh, you know, a long answer to your question. Um, so I'm guessing you might have some follow-up. So I'll go to you for if you have a follow-up on his answer. Okay, uh, so I would extend it a little bit further, uh, and it relates to my second point that I, I wanted to raise. Uh, <clears throat> so funding a UBI would require that there is a huge increase in taxes, and especially to the rich. And as uh, uh, Van Parage already uh, answered to that, people would have to an anticipate it. Well, as regards to the deadweight loss generated from increase in taxes, there is a huge amount of wealth that would go to no one. And there is one question that pops in my, into my mind right now. Is this ethical for all this wealth to, to go to no one? From this point, uh, to some sense, we are limiting our societies and our economy's potential. Moreover, we see that the size of the government would increase. Or, and uh, should we, or uh, under what circumstances, ought members of a society consent that the government takes care of their economic needs, as in a UBI, for instance. Then, uh, from the sense of compensation, uh, UBI requires not only that a malice or injustice occurred in the past, but also that that injustice resulted in material deprivation for the next generation. If, uh, for instance, on the contrary, uh, the injustice resulted in material improvement for his or, own, or, or her own descendants, one can still disapprove the preliminary injustice and at the same time fail to justify uh, any claims for compensation. Therefore, a procedural approach would make more sense in this case. It seems that uh, UBI is a consequentialist policy that induces blame, uh, at least uh, from those on the better off side, and in my view, we may yet have another reverse societal insider-outsider problem and a potentially cancel culture. Uh, rule governance wouldn't allow for much blame since the rules are the same for people, for each and every one, and therefore the outcomes uh, would be seen more just because the same rules did apply to everyone in the same way. And therefore, uh, to some degree, I anticipate that the outcome governance, outcome oriented governance would discriminate high achievers by merit. And from an individualistic point of view, uh, the imposition of uh, such extended, external standards of fairness would be rejected. So yeah, that's my, my response. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Drayton. Um, there is a lot there, <laughs> a lot to respond to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me clarify perhaps first uh, some uh, things that may be side issues. Um, first, you said um, uh, the introduction of the basic income would involve a high increase in taxation. Of course, this is not necessarily the case, and that is, uh, it depends on the level of uh, the basic income, and it depends on what it replaces. And um, as you might have seen, especially in our chapter seven, and so we are in favor of uh, the introduction of a modest basic income, so-called the partial basic income, that would uh, uh, replace some of the existing social transfers without, uh, uh, without worsening the situation of any of the poorest uh, households. And at the same time, it would go hand in hand in a country like Germany or like uh, our country, Belgium, France. It would go uh, along with uh, uh, significant 
reform of the personal uh, income tax system so that the basic income would replace the exemptions, the general exemptions that apply to all the lower layers of taxation so that the net cost in terms of higher taxation for some groups, possibly through uh, personal income taxation, but also uh, in other ways, uh, eco taxes or whatever, would uh, would not need to be a huge increase. Uh, of course, if you say 1,200 euros per month and per person for everyone, or like in uh, in, in the Swiss uh, referendum, 2,300 uh, Swiss francs, uh, and that ends up with 39% of GDP, of course, then it would be a huge increase, but it, it depends on what uh, what level and what it replaces. And certainly for the sort of reform I propose, it could, would, couldn't be characterized as a huge increase. There would be some increase um, on some of the higher incomes, but uh, not a huge one. Um, uh, another uh, point, uh, important point, I think, is that uh, yes, it would have an impact on uh, on GDP. And so you could say part of it, part of which could be characterized as a dead weight loss, as the immediate impact on uh, work and investment in incentives of uh, the change in the tax schedule, both because of an income effect and because of uh, the fact that everyone uh, will enjoy this uh, basic income as a basic security and because of a substitution effect uh, related to the modification in the marginal tax rate. So there is, there will be a, a dead weight loss in this sense, and but this is of course only part of the expected uh, impact on GDP because even more important is the impact via uh, the formation of human capital now where some people argue or because of the uh, lower incentive uh, due to uh, higher marginal tax rates, people will train less. But of course, the, you have the, the Zuckerberg uh, argument for basic income that say, no, it's, uh, it's sort of venture capital include for, uh, for the people. That is, uh, it will involve a, a systematic encouragement for further training, for the acquisition of skills, because it's, uh, it will enable everyone at every point in life to take an internship and to reduce working time in order to further train. So all this, about all these effects, we can only speculate. Um, but of course, the, part of the economic case, um, in my view, quite strong in favor of basic income relates not to the immediate impact on uh, on the labor market participation for the people at the bottom because of the suppression of the, the unemployment trap, but relates to the long-term impact on uh, the on human capital through the providing it's adequately coupled with uh, lifelong uh, training. So that and the, the question, well, is there or is there not going to be a significant negative effect? on uh, GDP per capita. And therefore, are we, as you suggest, are we not handicapping our society, preventing it from achieving some uh, of its objectives? And so what I'm saying, even the impact on GDP, we shouldn't say too quickly on the basis of narrow-minded and uh, myopic analysis of the labor market uh, and labor market participation, we shouldn't take for granted it would be negative. But secondly, more importantly, of course, GDP per, per capita only measured, measures um, um, monetary incomes. Uh, it, it doesn't uh, capture the gains that can be made thanks to well-used labor, uh, well-used leisure, and the, not, not the, the leisure, the so-called leisure of the unemployed uh, who are constantly trying to find a job and being stressed because they can't find one, but the leisure that can be taken by people in order to better look after their children, to get more involved in the community. And this is, of course, all part of what we need to look at in terms of uh, if, if we adopt a consequentialist uh, approach, and that is, it must be broader than simply the, the impact, the economic impact as measured by GDP. However important uh, a concern for the GDP may remain, and not as an indicator of uh, uh, what is good for a society, but certainly as uh, what we need in order to fund 
uh, any public resources. We need uh, GDP in order to tax it and use it uh, both for pure uh, distributive purposes, but also for public investment, for uh, for schools uh, and um, and all the rest. So um, I think uh, that is um, that replies to some aspects um, uh, of your question, but not quite to what you said at the end then about uh, the claims that could be made by high achievers. Uh, so. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, with a basic income, even as I think uh, is ethically right, even a basic income at the highest sustainable level would uh, leave quite a bit of room, some people say too much room, uh, for inequalities. And, um, and of course, the high achievers uh, are what is regarded as a high achiever uh, and high achievement. Uh, is not only should not only be regarded and it's not regarded by high achievers as pure being purely a material thing uh, uh, being a high achiever is also making interesting scientific discoveries uh, starting interesting uh, social uh, uh, social enterprises even if that doesn't show very much in uh, the earnings at the end of each month and so high achievements should not be reduced uh, to high incomes. And on the whole, by giving the greatest real freedom to those with least real freedom, you'll, en you'll enable more people to become high achievers in their own uh, uh, dimension of what uh, high achievement means. That would be my way of answering the last part of, uh, of your question. But it's a, it's a very rich question, which touches on many important aspects of the of the ethical debate on basic income. Uh, okay, we have a, a handout for one of the students in class, Benedict. Um, what's your question? Yeah, with a, a short, um, so my hand raised in the very beginning during uh, during Dritton's, uh, during Dritton's um, reading of his second question, um, when he mentioned dead weight loss and the fact that a huge amount of wealth that goes to no one, I was just wondering, aren't you, I mean, that is, as a matter of fact, happening right now. Aren't you criticizing UBI with what's already happening in the status quo? We have an enormous amount of free riding in today's advanced capitalist societies where entrepreneurs use public infrastructure but pay little to no taxes. Um, the gig economy has stripped millions of workers of, its right, of their rights. And um, in Germany, a lot, of, a lot of gig economy companies don't pay enough social contributions. Aren't you criticizing the proposed scheme with you know, something that's already an issue today? Aren't we, you know, isn't it switched? OK, uh, yeah, I'm also criticizing that. Uh, I mean, uh, when I mentioned dead weight loss, I simply uh, <clears throat> acquired that stance due to the wealth that is being lost and I, I that's a that's a principled uh, argument which doesn't necessarily um, uh, impose imposes on an UBI but also on other uh, policies which you already mentioned so uh, because the argument was about UBI and I simply uh, used that principle to to discuss about it. Uh, well, I'd like to say a little bit more about, about this issue. Well, your, your argument, if you're really, you know, we want to get her, uh, uh, I, 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 you, you, you've admitted that, well, actually the argument from the standpoint of, you know, dead weight losses um, isn't a defense of the existing system. Um, it is, uh, I'll make two points about it. One small point about it is that dead weight loss is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that everyone has enough food to eat, a, a, a safe place to sleep, proper medical care, and their other basic needs met. That is the economic problem. How do we get those out of our resources without destroying the environment that sustains us? That is the essential economic problem. A lot of economists um, uh, make really no distinction between needs and wants. But really, once we solve this problem, then the rest of the economic problem gets to be, well, how 
many more luxuries can we get out of our environment without destroying the environment sustains us? The economic problem should be divided into two. And if the first one causes a dead weight loss, well, so be it. Meeting people's needs is more important than, uh, than uh, getting rid of your de dead weight losses. Um, but the, the second one is your, 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 your argument isn't just a small departure from the status quo, but an enormous departure from the status quo. Because, because there are enormous dead weight losses in the system that we have now, um, where we have all of these giveaways to the wealthiest people in ways that monopolize them, give them market powers over other people, and hurt us all and hurt future generations in massive ways. All of those things would need to change to say, well, this is what we should do, even if that's instead of basic income. Okay, and I guess there's a third one, which is, which is that there are also, and none of those then, even if we get to that point, so we get rid of all these other dead weight losses by fixing these other things, is that there is an opportunity for at least some level of basic income without a dead weight loss. And that is, one is basic income is a lump sum transfer. So the basic income itself has no dead weight loss. Everybody gets the same, no matter what they do. So it gives you no substitution effect. It has income effects, but everything has income effects. It has no substitution effect, no inefficiency involved in basic income itself. Basic income, the taxes needed to ensure that basic income doesn't cause inflation, those might have dead weight losses. But there are taxes that have no dead weight loss. And those are taxes on resources and rents, things that are just sitting there. So to the extent that UBI is financed by taxes on resources and rents, it creates no dead weight loss. So it is not only, so your argument there is a massive, a market for massive reform of capitalism as we know it, and, and only a, a minor caution on basic income as, uh, as, as proposed, okay. Uh, Benedict's hand has gone back up. Back to you, Benedict. Um, so this relates, this may be a departure from the discussion that we're having right now. We may, because it, it, it delves on, you mentioned the environment and I was gonna yeah. ask a question about that. If we have somebody in the room that is, you know, that wants to discuss the point we're doing right now. Okay, then we'll now. Feel free okay. To, you know, uh, okay. Um, uh, Robert, are you on, on the point that we're on right now? Which is a pretty broad point, I must admit. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I'm particularly interested in the history or prehistory of uh, basic income. So maybe it's the time. So, you... Robert, Robert sir, is this question about the point that we're on right now? If not, we'll come back to it later. Uh, so maybe it's better to discuss it later. Okay, great. We'll come back to it later. Okay, Bernie, is your point on the uh, the point we're on now? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I would like to uh, support Felipe as well as uh, Carl. Also, say hello to Felipe. It's nice to see you <laughs> by that way. Uh, perfect match. And um, for a simple public sector argument, uh, uh, one could put together. Um, Carl's argument as well as Philippe's argument. Philippe's argument is more on taxation and Carl's argument more on the expenditure, yeah, <laughs> dead weight losses. And um, it depends on if you look at the tax incidence or if you look at the budgetary incidence. And the idea, for instance, of, um, of uh, Tony Atkinson was to um, to argue that if you switch from a graduated tax system financing a traditional social insurance system yeah, with, with a lot of in-kind transfers, yeah, then it's easy to see if you switch to flat taxes, yes, then you have no uh, 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 differential tax, uh, uh, debt weight loss on the tax side. If you switch from a system with a lot of means tested in kind transfers towards uh, uh, towards a, a cash transfer, then you have a big uh, um, a dead weight um, loss decrease on the public expenditure side. Yeah? 
you cannot measure because it's a measured in terms of utility. However, you measure utility, as Philippe said it, yeah. Um, if intrinsic motivation is integrated, then there is no way to measure this effects completely by GDP. But even with GDP, my arguments, and it was, it was at the time in middle of the 1990s, also the argument of Tony Atkinson is that you will see a differential uh, increase in wealth and welfare. Um, my uh, question now to, to Philippe is, um, uh, you ha had the argument with uh, freedom and also partly, this is partly coupled to the debt wealth loss argument uh, because I teach in my course, Economic Policy in Public Choice, a model of uh, Robert Kutor, yeah, who argued that liberty may be on the one hand priceless in an authoritarian regime and on the other hand worthless when the individuals are poor. Your argument seems to be the worthless thing. Yeah, that one needs a, a cash transfer basic income to overcome that poverty of worthless liberty. Yeah, if we overcome also with that the priceless liberty, which could be the fact, then Kutus' argument is then we are in trade off region between liberty, freedom on the one hand side, how you ever, however you would like to measure liberty and freedom, yeah, the degree of, and on the other hand, the degree of wealth there, that you may have. Uh, for relatively rich and democratized uh, societies, a trade off between, say, income or wealth and freedom. Do you think that Kuter is right on that? Yeah, <laughs> that whenever we move out of the classical uh, basic debt weight loss paradigm, that we have this trade off and that the trade off may be solved differently under different regimes in different societies? Or would you say, just like Rawls and others, that um, uh, liberty is a trump and always trumps wealth they are increasing. Uh, yes, I'm not completely sure I understood you, uh, but the trade-off you're talking about is a trade-off between the so-called priceless formal freedom that doesn't exist uh, under authoritarian regime and then uh, the uh, freedom that uh, is uh, worthless as long as it's not uh, backed by uh, sufficient wealth uh, and possess mastered by individuals on the other on the other hand uh, well um, and the way in which i try to articulate that uh, i'm back to my book uh, uh, real freedom for all is that uh, for me a, a just society is a society in which uh, people are as free as that can be, that is, in which the, the people with least freedom are as free as that can be. And uh, what I mean then by that freedom is then uh, first a minimal condition of uh, self-ownership of something like that, which would be the formal, the formal freedom that is being violated in authoritarian regimes, but this is not sufficient. And then uh, you, you need then not just wealth because this real freedom can also be made up of access to uh, free efficient uh, or highly subsidized public services of course your real freedom is in is increased if you have access to good public transport it, it's uh, increased if you have good schools it's uh, increased if uh, if you have uh, pleasant public spaces that are not just places for sustainable mobility, but also for enjoyable immobility. All these things are part of uh, the real freedom of a person. So it's not just a matter of individual uh, wealth. And so what I see in a way is that you have, a, 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 in a sense, a prior condition of self-ownership, but I wouldn't say that it totally trumps it, just as roles, in fact, in, in Rawls's constructions, um, there is a priority that is given to his first principles, to the fundamental liberties. But of course, he doesn't assert that uh, whatever public means could be used in the service of protecting these uh, fundamental li liberties should be used for that purpose, because then nothing would be left in order to 
uh, to pursue the aim of distributive justice, both aspects of this uh, second principle. So, so that also I think that formal freedom, uh, the one that's at risk um, in authoritarian societies, and indeed the one that some people say is at risk in our pandemic situations because of all the additional restrictions of our freedom about having to wear a mask, having to show a pass, etc. That is about the, the all about the formal freedom. And so I'm saying room must be made for that, for that, but it doesn't trump uh, the considerations uh, that have to uh, that relate to to real to the real aspect of of, of freedom. But both aspects uh, are important. So that with Couter's distinction, I find it uh, interesting uh, the way he puts it because it's uh, priceless on one side, uh, worthless on the other. I mean, it's a nice uh, play with words, and, but, um, but of course, uh, I mean, this idea of uh, freedom being worthless uh, even uh, is also already very present in, in, in those terms in Rawls' theory of justice where he says there are these fundamental liberties, including political liberties, but the worth of political liberties uh, can only be secured if you have uh, access to means of subsistence for everyone. And so there is already this, uh, this idea of freedom being worthless if you don't have uh, adequate means. But I, I repeat, and so the uh, the, these adequate means it's not only a matter of basic income it's also a matter of access to good quality public services i'm not in favor of uh, transforming everything into cash so okay, okay. thank you okay uh 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 do you have how many more points here was it three points total or four um uh, so you have one or two to go how many, how many points do you have left to go uh one more Oh, okay. Um, let's see. In that case, okay. Let's 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 go to that now, and then we'll. Oh, wait, did you have one more on this point? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. One more comment on this point, and then we'll get you the third point, and then finally, um, after we discuss that, we'll get to the unrelated points. I got a few of two of those. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Malvin. Yeah, it's a question which is related to the financing and um, what. What every proponent of the UBI um, says when it comes to financing is we're going to cut back, um, like it can be financed by partially cutting back on other aspects of social welfare. And um, my thought on this is that this could potentially be really dangerous because if you cut back this, like social welfare that was caught on for a long time to establish it and you cut it back and introduce a new UBI, then um, there is tech, like there's just one lever to control all um, governmental spending on social welfare. And I think it's not hard to imagine to have a very neoliberal government coming into place, um, like Margaret Thatcher, for example, in the past, who then um, can really do all the reforms that took her like I don't know how many terms she did to cut them back uh, with one with one single law. So just this potential of this reform, if it's not done properly, to actually really fail on the promise it gives to make uh, society fairer. And like your thoughts on the dangers of that. Yeah. Well, uh, yes, it's a concern that's uh, often um, expressed and um, so part of the answer of course is that uh, people like me don't propose a tabula rasa and so uh, the proposal is to have a, a basic income that provides this basic uh, economic security but uh, it's uh, social insurance is not being scrapped so people will keep having unemployment benefit related to uh, their past earnings because of the social security contributions that paid into a social insurance fund. Similarly, people will have a higher uh, pension, and so a top-up uh, pension, uh, in most cases uh, uh, a top-up that will be higher than the basic pension itself, 
uh, that will be related to their past uh, career. So the social insurance benefits will keep existing. But not only that, we'll still need, with a modest basic income, say at uh, 500 euros or so, or 600 euros in Germany, we'll still need um, parts of the existing social assistance uh, system for people who live on their own in cities. It won't be enough to pay for their housing. Uh, for people who have some sort of uh, handicap, uh, uh, even if they uh, didn't have uh, a working career that enables them to have uh, social insurance on top of that, we need to have social assistance uh, measure. And in many places, it will need to take the form of uh, housing benefits. And that will remain means tested. But of course, with a total amount that's much smaller because it operates against the background of a basic income. So uh, part of the answer consists in saying, uh, wait a minute, this is not about scrapping everything and just uh, having uh, a basic income as the sole, uh, as the only uh, social benefit. And the sec a second important element in the answer about the people who are afraid that at some point uh, some government may decide to reduce uh, dramatically the level of that uh, basic income. Uh, well, you must realize that we are already dependent and the poorest, especially the poorest workers, uh, but all, also the poorest unemployed are dependent not on uh, decisions taken by their trade union or by their employer, but on uh, decisions that are taken by our democratic uh, governments and parliaments. And so, for example, the level of the basic exemption, and that means that uh, everyone pays less in taxes because of this exemption of the lower layers, that's of course proportionally benefits mostly uh, low earners, but that is all decided by a democrat uh, democratic institutions and would be, is currently dependent on it in the same way as a basic income, the level of a basic income would be uh, dependent on it. Of course, if we distrust <laughs> the democracy, if we believe that uh, we are uh, at the mercy of some holdup by a democratic majority at any point, well, then uh, we can't put much trust in the economic security provided by the basic income, but then we can't put much trust in much of what is going on now uh, in our welfare states that are also dependent on democratic decisions. It's not as if the employers and the trade unions were discussing that and establishing them uh, in isolation without any guarantee given by democratic power. So this would be my two answers to your question. So one, uh, no one serious is proposing a tabula rasa, and two, uh, even uh, now, we are highly dependent on democratic decisions and the, the stability of these decisions, just as we would be with a basic income. Okay. Uh, so, Dritan, now you go to your third point. Okay, so this is not a question, but more of a comment uh, and uh, maybe it's a differing opinion uh, with Philippe Vampereich. So towards the end of chapter five, you argued that due to people's preferences uh, changing, increasing the aggregate level of happiness does not make sense as a long-term objective. Uh, well, that might be true, depending on how you look at it. And you, in the beginning, described uh, or uh, clarified that with the GDP example. What I think is important to mention here is that humans' instincts have always been the same. Today, we built houses as a shelter. Our early ancestors found caves or other unsophisticated solutions. So any readers in anthropology, please correct me. I'd like to further relate this to Robert Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, humans have always had physiological needs, safety needs, sense of belonging needs, uh, esteem and self-actualization needs. And in fact, what we are seeing today is simply an evolution of our needs, uh, preferences and so on. But the genesis is still there. Uh, based on this and to my own understanding, uh, it is quite the contrary. We should point at happiness as a long-term objective. And UBI may have the capacity to do that, at least as shown by the results of the Finnish experiment, 
where people reported that their well-being had improved. But again, uh, we do not really know the long-term effects of it, whether countries will be able to sustain it or whether countries with a UBI would be more attractive to mi migrants and whatnot. So yeah, that's my last point. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for that uh, comment. Yes, we are uh, at the end of um, uh, ethical chapter. We are uh, not very friendly uh, to the people who say, well, look at the basic income. It's a fantastic idea because it makes people happier. And, and of course, I mean, you, when you look at the nice little videos about uh, Namibia and the village and you see all these smiling people who are very happy about the money they received, I mean, all this is uh, frankly not a very serious way of arguing in favor of a basic income. And uh, what uh, we are, and we look at a number of arguments that uh, are used in order to say that structurally a basic income would uh, increase happiness. Of course, you, you can't just look at the people whose income would increase or whose freedom would increase, but you should also look at the people who you mentioned before, the high, some of the high achievers or some of the people who were expecting to make a lot of money and, uh, and then uh, who can make less money because the high levels of taxation that are needed in order to distribute this money to other people and make them uh, happier. So what the net effect would be, uh, I mean, you can speculate about it, but the basic point is that we shouldn't formulate our ideal of a good society in terms of the level of happiness that uh, it reaches. And then we refer to, um, uh, to what we call Durkheim's paradox, huh, where Emil Durkheim in, uh, in uh, one of his main uh, classic books um, points out that there is this strange paradox uh, between uh, that, that is given by the negative correlation between what he calls the degree of civilization on the one hand and the degree of happiness uh, on the other. And so as the indicator of the degree of uh, the relevant notion of happiness, he takes the, the inverse of the rate of suicide, of what he calls sad suicide, as opposed to kamikazes and so on, who are uh, committing suicide as part of their duty. And uh, so he says, well, uh, uh, happiness so measured is in fact inversely correlated with the degree of civilization as measured in part by the uh, degree of economic development and in part by the degree of development of equality, equal rights, uh, respect for fundamental rights. There's a negative correlation. Um, so what should we conclude? That we should try to be less civilized in this sense? No, he says what we should conclude is that the aim is not to make people as satisfied as possible, but to have a society that is just, that is fair, that has equality between men and women, that uh, respects uh, freedom of expression, etc. All these features need to be protected, even if there is no good reason that it will make us on average uh, happier. And so, uh, the, the uh, we have uh, in fact that part of the of our chapter was recently translated in French and uh, under the title uh, in French we have this expression which you have uh, no doubt in other languages which is uh, uh, l'argent ne fait pas le bonheur money doesn't make happy and so uh, uh, the title uh, that was put for this article uh, was uh, basic income doesn't make for happiness and so what? And so what? <laughs> so there, there's no, no strong case in favor of it, but I believe there is a strong case in terms of social justice and because of not only the greater purchasing power it gives to the, to the more vulnerable people in our society, but because of the great bargaining power, it gives them the, the greater access to leisure, not only to income, and this is what makes basic income a just measure, even if it's not uh, a measure that is uh, making people on average uh, happier or more satisfied with life than is currently the case. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up on this issue and time is getting tight. So I'm going to go to the, uh, the two unrelated questions we have in the queue. 
Uh, and the first of those is from Benedict. Go ahead. Second one's from Rob. So, um, Professor Ben Perez, I'd love to hear your take on um, UBI and a potential increase in ecologi ecological justice. Um, when I read the chapter on free riding, I immediately had to, as an economics student, uh, obviously had to think of the free riding behavior in terms of you know ecological externalities, where uh, we can clearly see that the the, the richest one percent uh, in basically any Western country behave like ecological vandals, while a broad uh, uh, amount of, of persons globally have to you know suffer the consequences and. Um, there have been UBI, uh, UBI-esque uh, schemes proposed for you know, taxing very um, environmentally damaging things very heavily and distributing um, the income from the tax levy equally amongst you know, uh, members of a nation, which would uh, incentivize ecologically sustainable behavior. Um, and I was wondering, do you think that UBI in general or certain uh, forms of UBI can um, increase ecological justice by incentivizing uh, sustainable behavior? And what are the limits of you know, redistribution in the fight against uh, climate change and uh, the environmental challenges we have in the 21st century? Yeah, uh, can I add to that before you answer? And that's, uh... To me, when I said before about deadweight loss, I mentioned monopolization, but I didn't mention this environment. Well, I sort of alluded to it, but the environment That's is the, the enough, biggest yeah. source of deadweight loss in the world today. I have in my lungs right now a uh, rubber that has come off of the tires of people driving around the world. And that's not even the top 20 sources of pollution in this world. It's in my lungs right now, and yours too. That's an, and it's not price. They do that for free. That's just one little example of source of dead weight loss. There's so much of that. And we are killing the environment that sustains us. OK, Philippe? Yes, um, good question. Uh, so we discussed that in, uh, in chapter 7 when we go through the various, um, the attitudes of the various uh, political uh, currents, traditions towards basic income, and then we discuss the Greens in particular. But it seems to me that there are two main aspects, and, uh, and we shouldn't say, of course, too quickly that uh, basic income and green concerns go together. But the first one, which for me was present from the very start, and when the idea came to me, it was in part for that very reason, came to me in 1982, before most of you were born. And, um, and, and it was the, the following at the time, and still to a much lesser extent, but still to some extent today, both the right and the left, in, in, in periods of high un, uh, unemployment thought, the only solution is faster growth. And so we can expect uh, further uh, technological advance that will create structural unemployment. How do we solve that? Well, if you need only one man instead of two to produce a car, you produce two cars. Simple. And so uh, I thought this is crazy, but at the same time, I thought unemployment is a major problem. Involuntary unemployment, the people, the fact that people, the, the, I mean, the, the sense people give to their lives is completely sabotaged by the fact that they can't get access to the sort of recognition that would be given by a paid job. So we, we can't just say, oh, well, uh, that's uh, not a problem unemployment. We must be able to address it. And so what I saw basic income uh, as was uh, also as uh, what well, was in part as a way of addressing that problem, how we could solve the problem of unemployment without relying on ever faster growth by saying, well, uh, we'll give some everyone uh, a basic income that, so that the people who work too much can work less, uh, interrupt their working time, partly in order to retrain uh, or, their in, in, uh, or work part-time, etc. And these jobs can then be filled if only on a part-time basis, because it can be combined with the basic income. Uh, it can be filled by people who are currently unemployed. And so this seemed to be 
a meaningful way of addressing the problem of unemployment that was e e e ecologically sound and that was not ecologically crazy as uh, uh, ever further growth, growth was. So this is to me one connection and uh, that remains valid today, even though this big consensus, which was completely uncontroversial, uncontro practically uncontroversial between the right and the left at the time, between the labor unions and the um, employers, is now, as a result of the awareness of climate change and all the rest, has now become much weaker. So that's one connection. But the other connection is related to the way in which it will, uh, basic income will be funded or partly funded, because the sheer fact that we distribute the income in a conditional way rather than in a conditional way, or the sheer fact that we re that we distribute more from the rich, high polluters to the poor, currently uh, who currently pollute less, doesn't mean that the overall level of pollution or of COD, CO2 emissions will be reduced. I mean, you might even expect that it may it may in increase in some at least in some countries or in some sectors, but it depends on the way you fund it. And, uh, and if at least part of the funding, as is increasingly advocated, comes from uh, taxes on uh, carbon or other ecological damage, well, then, of course, it, uh, that will help uh, a basic income taken together with the way in which it is funded it will make uh, basic income uh, also for that reason uh, an ecologically uh, or ecology friendly uh, measure um, but in this case it's contingently related to the way in which it is funded and it's not intrinsic to the basic income itself and so this there are other connections between basic income and ecology but this these seem to me the two main ones Okay, uh, Dritan wants to follow up on this, so go ahead, Dritan. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to add something about the ecological uh, thing that Benedict raised. The city that I live uh, in 2017 was the most polluted city in Europe. Which, which city is that? Uh, Tetovo, North Macedonia. Okay. Uh, so I am too con very concerned about the externalities of the polluters. And, but I just want to add that there is no amount of money or uh, whatever compensation, uh, whatever anything given to me in a form of compensation that could, uh, you know, com uh, could compensate for my damaged health, for instance. So uh, while, I mean, we can we can we can uh, internalize externalities in other ways without having to uh, we, without having to compensate people. I mean, there isn't a one-to-one -one equivalence giving people money for in compensation for their damaged health. So yeah. But, but if I can just briefly react to that, because the here is not a question of compensating the people for the the damage they suffered. It's a matter of providing incentives to do the right thing for the environment. And so and by making pay, people pay the true cost of what they consume. So if directly or indirectly you consume goods that produce a, a lot of CO2 and that uh, mean that has, has an implication taken globally that we go above the threshold of what is digestible by the atmosphere, well, we need to pay the true cost for that and the fact that we pollute as much as we do means that other people uh, can pollute less. And so once we pay the true cost on that, much less of that uh, will be, uh, will be much, much less of that damage will be done. So whether the people who actually suffered the damage would get as a result of that the right compensation can absolutely not be guaranteed because the, the sharing will be a sort of lump sum to everyone and some people, for some reason, will not have suffered very much from uh, the pollution, and some people will have died from it and could not even be compensated because of no longer being there. Actually, and I should add here, actually, in mainstream economic theory, if you want to eliminate deadweight loss, you have to not only have the person pay, but also have them, have them pay the person they do the damage to. Uh, only then do you fully internalize 
the effects of the transaction on all sides of the transaction. Uh, I bought something from you, and uh, and it hurts Benedict. Um, then we pay Benedict, bringing him in on there, and then we're all uh, we all have we all then have um, the incentive to change our behavior given the true costs of it. If we leave Benedict out, his behavior doesn't change given those costs. Of course, it's impossible to pay everyone because a lot of them, a lot of people being hurt the most haven't been born yet. Um, so, uh, so we can't, we can't pay it. We have to pay you know, people. We have to pay more than what we're giving the current generation. But that is usually when you're talking about eliminating dead weight loss, you talk about this person pays that person. Okay. Um, now we have one more question. Uh, we are technically out of time, but we have one, one more question. Uh, from Robert, who has wanted to ask a question for, for a while, though. So there you go, Robert. Thank you. As I wrote in the chat, I'm especially interested in the debate between our guest, Philippe, and Andre Gott's debate, which took place in the 1980s. So can you please tell us uh, a little um, more about this debate? Is it still uh, actual? As far as I know, Andre Gortz, a uh, long time, he was uh, skeptic, skeptical about basic income. So um, we, we can't ask Andre Gortz, what, what do you think? What do you remember um, of this exchange of ideas and uh, um, yeah. proposals? Okay. Well, that's a good uh, last question. And um, also partly because I'm, Andre Goss is someone for whom I had a lot of admiration, a lot of affection. I uh, dedicated one of my books to him called uh, Refonder la Solidarité. I visited him twice also uh, with uh, my wife, in one case with my children, in the house in uh, Vonon in Champagne, where he committed suicide uh, jointly with uh, his wife, uh, as you know. And, uh, and I'm, uh, our relationship started rather badly. Uh, because uh, he had written a piece uh, to be published in a magazine, a left-wing magazine here in, uh, in Belgium. And uh, the, the authors, uh, uh, the, the editors of the journal asked me to, uh, the, to write a comment. But I wrote my comment in the sort of, uh, uh, I would say, tradition of uh, analytical philosophy in which I was trained and uh, explaining why I didn't agree with uh, with his arguments, essentially, in that that was at a stage where he was still uh, coupling the the idea of a, a, a sort of a basic uh, minimum for everyone, coupling it with uh, the obligation of a civil service uh, of about uh, twenty thousand, and arguing that uh, the liberation of people also involved that participation in what he called the heteronymous work uh, of uh, but of limited duration and i think i even used in uh, in that paper a sort of a bit of a of a cheeky uh, analogy with uh, the the motto at the entrance of the, the concentration camps uh, arbeit macht frei and where, uh, because part of his argument was that uh, work, that is uh, salaried work, paid work, and was part of what would give people freedom. And, and for me, the, the freedom, the real freedom to have access to work is very important. So it's, I'm not denying the importance of work, but I would not claim that it is a work that makes you free. Anyway, I was teasing him to, a bit like that, I got a, a letter back saying that uh, people, uh, he, he said it was not the first time that the people with whom he sympathized uh, privately, this, this was before I, I, quite a bit before I met him for the first time, but we had only corresponded, not the first time that he discovered the people with uh, whom he, he uh, one could sympathize uh, privately behaved as the uh, bouja, as uh, uh, rude people uh, as soon as they were in public. So I apologize because it was certainly not my intention to do so. And from then on, we really uh, got on well. And uh, and in fact, many of uh, 
the arguments uh, he used, uh, I found extremely congenial in favor of something that started looking more and more as time went on, like an unconditional basic income, because part of his, uh, what was central in his approach was really this defense of the autonomous sphere, that is, of the sphere of uh, activities, including productive activities that escape both from the uh, control from governance by the market and from governance by the state, by the public authorities. So, and uh, I've always found also that the best way of characterizing uh, the green uh, tradition uh, of political thought uh, with respect to the liberal tradition and the socialist tradition, if there was one, was in those terms. That is, uh, and the liberals want more market, the socialists want more state, and then the greens want more community or more uh, autonomous uh, sphere. And it's André Gors in line with Ivan Illich who, uh, who, who then uh, articulated that in, in the most uh, rigorous way in, in a less uh, sort of uh, fanciful way than, uh, than or provocative way than uh, Ivan Illich. And then, indeed, uh, in the end, uh, he, he, by thinking about it, he thought, yes, uh, I'm the best way of uh, making people, of protecting this autonomous sphere, of preserving them against uh, the, the, the pressure, the enrollment, both by the market and by the state, was to give them an unconditional income, providing uh, it was uh, high enough. And then uh, he, he sent me this letter, which uh, I think was well, somewhere on the on the web somewhere, which uh, which uh, uh, ends by saying, by the way, I've just paid my my uh, country my contribution to uh, my fee uh, to Bien to the Basic Income uh, Network. That was when I was a secretary of the of the network in the early days, yeah. and uh, and then it uh, said continue continue with. Uh, which is a bit similar to someone else who Andre Gerson might greatly, who is Herbert Marcuse. And once when uh, walking in the little graveyard uh, on Chausseestrasse in Berlin, where uh, Hegel and Fichte are buried with their wives, I discovered a new grave, which was uh, Herbert Marcuse's uh, grave. And on that grave, there is just his name and then Weitermachen. And so I, uh, I, I told God that uh, his continue was like the Weitermachen of uh, Herbert Marcuse. So this, as the last question, was a way of uh, getting some anecdotes, but indeed, uh, I mean, part of the history of a movement and of an idea uh, is a matter of personal relations between people. All right, thank you very much, Philippe. Thanks a lot. Thank you to all and uh, good luck to the Freiburg uh, Basic Income Project, uh, Bernard and uh, all the others. Yeah. Bye. Okay.